Hello, I'm Luca De Giglio, and this is the Web3 in Travel podcast, where you can learn about crypto, blockchain, and how the new internet will change travel. Today, we will talk about governance. Governance is how things are decided in Web3, broadly speaking. And I want to start from the first governance we ever had in crypto, which is how Bitcoin decides things, which is quite interesting because things changed a lot since Bitcoin was born. But to this day, I think Bitcoin is still the best decentralized model for governance. And when I say best decentralized model, I don't mean the best kind of governance. I mean the most resilient to attack by actors who want to control the network. Because the worst thing which can happen to a project like Bitcoin is that one single entity or a group of people control it. And from there, we will move to other kinds of governance, maybe more centralized, more precise, more flexible. And as with everything in crypto, the level of decentralization you need depends on the project you have. So if you want to reinvent money, you need as much decentralization as you can because you're going to attract a lot of attacks from people who don't want you to create a new kind of money. While if you're planning a video game on Web3, maybe you can be centralized to some extent. So one way to see this is to kind of forecast the level of attack you're going to have, how many enemies you're going to make, and accordingly to that, decentralize your project. How does Bitcoin reach consensus? Because this is not only about decisions, it's about consensus. So there is a proposal and then people have to kind of vote for it. So let's suppose that somebody wants to say, okay, we need to make Bitcoin faster. Let's make blocks bigger. This is a bit technical, but like it's basically saying, let's make every 10 minutes to have more transactions go in a block. How does it work? Are there elections for that? Not really. There's somebody making a proposal and there's people accepting it or not. And what makes Bitcoin governance system resilient is that the people deciding usually have different incentives. So you have miners on one side, you have the developers, those who write the code, so those who can actually upgrade the system, and then you have the people, the people who have Bitcoin. So let's say that miners make a proposal and this proposal looks to be very good for them but bad for developers and uh, holders, people who own Bitcoin. If the developers are against it, there won't be enough consensus to actually push this code change, because it is always a code change, to the core software. So you need to convince the developers. Oh, so the developers have total control of the system? No, let's say the developers make a change which miners do not like. Maybe it makes them less money. It makes it not profitable. They will not run the code because miners are those who actually run the code. So developers write the code, miners run the code. Uh, So let's say the developers and miners agree to a change which is really bad for the price of Bitcoin and but good for miners and developers. And so every holder will be damaged. So the developers will actually push the code, so the push will run. The miners will actually accept this change, so the the code will run in the mining network, and the holders will simply sell the Bitcoin. So you have now a new Bitcoin system, which nobody wants, and the price goes to zero. So you need a very wide consensus to change anything in Bitcoin, because there are people with different interests, which makes Bitcoin very slow in upgrading, very safe, so they actually optimize for safety, and very resilient. And this makes sense, because again, Bitcoin wants to be money, and money by itself is not something which needs to change a lot, at least at the base layer. Then if you want to make it faster and more private and whatever, you can create layer two solutions like the Lightning Network. And over there, there's less need for consensus, you just do the software you want, You don't need to change anything on Bitcoin itself, and it will be successful if people use it. 
Now, this model, this consensus model, wouldn't work in Ethereum and more flexible blockchains, which are not optimizing as much for stability. They're optimizing more for innovation. Why? Well, because they do completely different things. Bitcoin wants to be money. Web3 in general wants to be the new web. And if you are new to crypto, you may be forgiven for thinking that Bitcoin and Ethereum are pretty similar, but they are completely different ecosystems. They don't even talk to each other and they have completely different goals. So we will focus mostly on how decisions are taken for Web3. So again, for Ethereum and all the other chains, because there is where Web3 is actually happening. All right, so first of all, governance in Web3 is really new. It's a very experimental phase, and I would say it doesn't really work very well. Tools are new, the culture is not ready for it, there's a lot of centralization in decision-making. Many governance tokens are, for instance, in the hand of few people, so when you think you are voting, actually you're just you know, putting a vote there, but then a couple of people can decide the whole thing. So we cannot say, all right, governance is fixed. Let's decide everything in the world through token voting. We are really far from that. But at the same time, we can already do things which we couldn't do before and improve the participation of the crowds. And before you jump in thinking that this is democracy, It is not really democracy, because democracy, at least in the form we experience today, is a system in which one person has one vote, while most crypto governance is you vote with your tokens. So the more tokens you have, the the more votes you can give. So the more weight you have. Let's see how this actually works. Let's say that we have a DAO and we want to build some software, create some software for for Web3 in travel. The first step would probably be to put some money in a safe. And I already told you about the Gnosis safe, G-N-O-N-I-S, which is the standard de facto safe and bank of the internet. And let's say that 10 people put some money into this safe. I don't know, $1,000 each, we have $10,000. And the safe is managed and governed by six out of 10 people. So if you want to move this money to you know, buy something, six out of the 10 people have to vote. So we have a system in which 10 people have a voting right, and at least six of them have to agree to move the money. This is already a very clean governance system. It's governance on the funds. And if the DAO stays at this level, there are 10 people in the DAO working on it, it is pretty easy to reach consensus. Because somebody can do a proposal, and if there's at least six people who agree, they simply decide by voting and moving the money. They can do all their discussions in a forum, on a voice system, but the real decision is taken when they make a signature and they move the money. So a Nozzy safe is already a very powerful governance tool, which we did not have before. Before you had to say, okay, the money is in the bank and this person, usually the CFO, has the control of the bank. So let's hope it doesn't run away with it. Maybe we can put two signatures, whatever, but it's a whole cumbersome process because banks run on fiat money and fiat money is not programmable. You cannot create a Nazi safe. You need a, a bank to actually build the system for you. And there's a lot of papers to be signed. You can set up a Nozzy safe in five minutes and you have this incredible tool which is extremely powerful and can manage billions of dollars in five minutes. Now, what happens when the DAO grows and they go from 10 people to 100? Are 100 people going to have the keys to move the money? And in that case, you would need, let's say, 60 people to vote every single time? Well, maybe, but I wouldn't go that way. And what happens when the DAO goes to a thousand members and it becomes unfeasible to have everybody have power of signing over the money? It becomes very hard to manage. So what you can do is to distribute tokens and you can call them governance tokens. So you say these tokens have monetary value because if they have monetary value, they are worthless. And if they're worthless, nobody wants them. If nobody wants them then how are you going to make sure that they don't all end up in the hands of one person? 
So you launch a token and you distribute it and people can vote with it. So in that case, they would use a system like Snapshot. Somebody writes a proposal and people connect to the snapshot.org website. They go in your section and they can sign a transaction, which means they are voting. So the more tokens you have, the more your vote is important. And this is the very basic governance system on, on Web3. This is evolving very fast. That's why I was saying it, it's not ready. It wouldn't evolve so fast if it was ready, right? When Snapshot became popular at the end of 2020, I remember using it for the first time to vote in the Sushi proposals. There was just one way. One vote is one token. And the whales, the whales are people who have a lot of tokens, could simply decide what was going to be voted. Now there are already a few systems. The first one is this one, which is the single choice vote. You can choose one of the options in the question and your vote depends on how many tokens you have. We have now also approval voting. So there's a few options and you can vote a few of them. Then there is this very interesting quadratic voting. There's a lot of innovation on that matter which roughly speaking means, okay, it is not one person, one vote. The more tokens you have, the more weight you have on the election. But as your tokens grow, like the more tokens you have, your increase in power diminishes, which is easily explained by saying 100 people with one token will weight more than one person with a thousand tokens. So the 100 people with one token is 100 tokens. And the one person with a thousand tokens is a thousand tokens. So it's 100 against a thousand, but still the 100 people vote is more important. It carries more weight. This is clearly a way to try avoiding whales decision making. And then there's a few other options, which I won't get into this. This is just to tell you that it's already grown a lot in a year. There's many more options. And in a way, we are experimenting with real democracy here, right? In, in real democracy is one person, one vote, and that's, that's all we all ever had. Now, unless you think democracy is perfect, you would say, okay, experiments are good. Even if they're done with you know, tokens and for unconsequential stuff, it's still interesting to, to learn from them. This is why I think the Web3 governance is going to give us uh, excellent examples and excellent uh, data for maybe improving democracy itself in the future. And let's go back for a second to the attitude thing. I talked about this in, in other uh, episodes. If your attitude here is, yeah, you know, this stuff doesn't work, the, the votes do not reflect the majority, or only the whales decide this is something stupid, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you're probably wasting your time. We are not saying this is the best way humans have found in history to decide things. This is, well, there's new experiments we can do. And we have learned through science that experiments are the way forward, right? So maybe we'll come out on the other side with incredibly efficient ways to coordinate people across the globe. And that's when legacy systems like, you know, the usual corporation, which has a specific and very long time tested way to govern stuff, may come under attack. And we may start thinking, well, for this specific project, we should go with the DAO. We cannot use a company. And my thesis, as you may know, is that companies are perfect for the, and have been perfect for the pre-internet era, but they are kind of struggling to adapt. And we will simply see better ways to coordinate people across the internet, which doesn't mean companies will die, but they're going to try also new systems. And there's going to be hybrid Web2 and Web3 companies, hybrid pre-internet and internet companies, etc. So expect a lot of innovation out of governance in Web3. Now, you're probably wondering, okay, this sounds interesting. Should I close my company and go completely Web3? Uh, I wouldn't do that. As I said, the governance systems are not mature. This is the experimental phase for Web3. So yes, it would be great if you start experimenting something, maybe not even connected to your company, with this kind of governance. Or maybe issue a token and let your customers decide a few things about you know, how to run your company. 
maybe at the beginning not very impactful things like you know maybe let them decide the next color of of your line of products or whatever i don't know you need to be creative or maybe better just join a dao something you like and see how the decision making is is made there so let's talk about this so we have a big dao with many people with tokens and they vote through a snapshot about a proposal and there's two kinds of mechanisms there there's the indirect mechanism in which people vote but nothing happens so the vote is kind of on chain you actually use your wallet but when the majority is voted for something and the proposal is approved there's nothing happening maybe the proposal was about issuing a grant to somebody the vote passes but the money doesn't move so the people holding the safe they now have to actually make the transaction they could not do it they could not respect the outcome of the vote this is why there's also the direct voting in which people vote and the vote actually initiates a transaction and the money moves think about it you can have 10000 people who do not know each other who all tokens on a project and who can actually move money collectively without anybody in a position of power to stop this of course this doesn't make sense for many projects but think about the power we have now with web3 that was simply impossible before that and we can only imagine the applications for such a thing think it from the point of view of the voter the token holder the token holder is part of a collective which can move money directly without anybody being able to stop it not the ceo of the dao and there are no ceos in daos but not the boss of the dao not the founder of the dao not the core team of the dao whatever 10 people 100 people 10000 people a million people a billion people can today vote to move money around so i leave to you the possible applications because they are really endless and we haven't yet scratched the surface of what we can do with these new tools they were simply not there before and speaking of tools i told you about the nosy safe which is the bank i told you the snapshot website which is the voting mechanism and there's many many others again it's a very experimental phase so there's many softwares uh, one of the oldest probably the oldest is aragon aragon is a complete suite of dao governance tools which has been around for many years now which goes beyond simply having the money in a safe and making some votes it's a whole platform now the last time i tested was at the beginning of 2021 and i wasn't really happy with it but it's certainly evolved i haven't followed i'm going to go back to it another one which i have used a bit as as a test was colony and i know that colony has evolved a lot recently and i haven't tested it so i'm pretty sure that these softwares and other new softwares and will come out and basically make it easy for anyone to spin up a dao these softwares are free and open source this is really important so you don't need to buy a license you don't need to trust their code you simply go there and use them they're going to cost you fees in blockchain but so if you don't use ethereum and i wouldn't suggest to use ethereum for most of these complex softwares you probably wouldn't spend much money in fees while i would suggest to use the nosy safe at least in part on the ethereum mainnet it's going to cost you fees but you have the money there which is safe especially if it's a lot and the snapshot system doesn't cost any fee is gasless so you do the signature the signature is not writing anything on the blockchain so the blockchain is not asking you to pay money because it's not actually doing anything resource intensive so what can we do today with these tools in web3 in travel well these are tools they don't tell you what you can do they don't tell you how to use them and for what right you have a hammer the hammer doesn't tell you where to put a nail and for what reason it's just a hammer so these are tools and they won't give you any hint on on what to do this is completely up to us it has to start from a problem we have and we have to see which are the best tools to solve it are the centralized voting systems 
decentralized safes something which can push us forward okay if we say yes we can try we can again experiment and see and see if they work for for our specific problem we don't have really a problem where we see a big opportunity in improving something okay let's let's try let's see if these tools are okay for that and we will never know it until we start uh, can you ignore this thing can you say okay it's not mature it's not ready i'm gonna wait until it's ready yes you certainly can um, maybe you're just giving up on some opportunities to be on the forefront of some change maybe to be left behind maybe not who knows right this is really early days especially in travel but if you hear um and you have interest in getting deeper into these things i would suggest you to start trying to be part of some governance how does it work well you have to make an application online with the government first show your passport and show your last bank account prove that you have no criminal record and then you have to wait a couple of months to get the approval and then you're going to get a letter and you have to sign it and send it back. And of course, I'm joking. You don't need to do any of that. You just need to get into a project you think is interesting for you. Look at the project. Look at the discussion they're having in their Discord or in their forums. And if you want to try be part of the governance, all you have to do is to acquire some of the tokens. Maybe you have to buy them. Maybe you can help them and get some for free. It depends but you do need some tokens or you need some nfts nfts are also a way for people to vote if you hold the nft you have a vote if you remember an nft is just a token which has this specific characteristic which is just it's one only which doesn't mean you cannot have 10 nfts of the same kind and use it for 10 votes but yeah to be part of governance you need to have tokens until you have tokens, you can be part of the discussion. You can actually even make proposals, but you won't be able to vote. Now, let's talk about real governance and fake governance. Real governance is what I've just tried to explain you. People actually take decisions. Fake governance is like elections in the Soviet Union, in which people could vote, but the candidates were pre-selected and the outcome was already clear. So as we have fake democracy, we are going to have fake governance. So many companies will do the following. They, will, they are centralized. They want to show they are you know, on the cutting edge of technology. They want to show they're giving power to the community. They are going to issue tokens or NFTs, and they're going to let us vote. And maybe they're going to let us vote on stuff which is not actually important. Or they're going to let us vote, but they have the majority of tokens and they're going to see how the election goes. And if it goes in the direction they want, they will just let it go. If it goes in the directions they do not want, they will get in with their millions of tokens and vote on the other side. So be careful before you get into this democracy theater, because if you do that, you are giving credibility to them because the more people vote, the better the more credible the whole system is. But since the system is unfair, you are just giving them credibility and authority on something they shouldn't have. This will happen. And it will happen mostly, in my opinion, from centralized companies who struggle to decentralize. Because companies are in the DNA, they are centralized. And this is okay. And as they will understand that having some at least aspect of the centralization is good for the business model for the bottom line they will do all they can to pretend that they are decentralized another problem governance has today and it's a huge problem is that very few people vote there are projects with millions of people in it and when they make a proposal you have a hundred people voting this is called voters apathy and why is there voters apathy well First of all, because there's no really direct advantage in voting. You have to read the proposal, you have to understand it, and then you have to vote. So a big project with 10 people voting makes the whole governance system not credible, does it? So how do you incentivize voting? Well, you could pay people tokens to vote, but then you are actually bribing them, and they're going to vote just randomly because they want the tokens. So this neither 
works. An indirect way to incentivize people to vote has been that many projects launching tokens and have actually sent those tokens, airdrop those tokens to people who actually vote. Why? Well, because they want to give tokens to people who actually vote. And this is also not really a good system, in my opinion, because people now will vote just randomly in order to get maybe tokens in the future. The best way to have actually voter engagement is through delegation. And projects are starting to use it. The first one, to my knowledge, is Gitcoin. And Gitcoin has airdrop tokens to their users. But in the moment, right after you got your tokens, you claim your tokens, you were given a choice of delegates. And you basically gave your voting rights to somebody else. You could revoke it anytime but you gave it to somebody else who actually is now representing many votes and takes the time to read the proposals, to discuss them, and to then vote. Another decentralized project which has used this approach recently is ENS, the ENS domain system, again, in which you got your tokens, you claimed your tokens, and then you could delegate your tokens to somebody else. This to date is probably the best way we have found to fight voter apathy. But we'll see more. Again, this is innovating at an incredible speed. So we'll see new ways to, to vote. We'll see new ways to get people engaged. We'll see, we'll see a lot of things happening. And that alone makes it really, really interesting. Now, so far, I may have given you the impression that all of this is really theoretical and not mature, but actually the voting systems, the governance systems on Web3 are already moving real money at an incredible rate. Something which happens very often, and it's actually a standard way to allocate capital in in Web3, is seen from the point of view of a person who wants to participate in a project. Let's say you like a project and you have an idea to improve it. You can simply go on a forum on Discord and make a proposal and say, okay, guys, I need $100,000 a year to develop this thing, or I need $50,000 a year to do that thing, to take care of this aspect, right? You make the proposal. And if people believe what you say and they think you can do it, they are going to vote for giving you the money and you will get the money. Now, they're probably going to say, okay, we give you a thousand now, then five thousand later. And as you go, you know, through milestones, you get more. But I've seen people getting salaries in this way. They say, okay, I want to take care of the marketing and I want that money per month. And they start getting that money per month after one day and they start working. If they're not good, the money stops. It's voted to stop. If they're good, the money keeps coming. People are getting grants and they're getting jobs on Web3 through governance. So governance is actually already working. I tried to be not too optimistic and to tell you where the limits are, but this is actually being used today to move real money and to allow decentralized projects to actually allocate capital and create value. So who knows, maybe your next job in in travel is going to be paid by a DAO uh, which voted your proposal and then you got your nice salary. And of course, the salary here is not in fiat, euro or dollars. It's in their token project or maybe in ETH or some stable coin or a mix of them. This stuff is happening today. I'm not talking anymore about future potential development like a couple of years ago. This is happening already, and it can scale very, very quickly. So here you go. Another great reason to study and work in Web3. There is an incredible range of opportunities, which I've never seen in my whole life. So get on it. If you think this is interesting, don't miss it. It can really, really change your life. All right, this is the end of today's episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. For more insights on Web3, follow me on Twitter at tripluca, T-R-I-P-L-U-C-A. And see you next time.